Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Paul was in Corinth for 1.5 years, staying with the people there and the church there that he founded. Paul stayed with Corinth longer than any other place except for the people and the church in Ephesus. In Acts 18, verses 1 through 3, we hear that Paul made tents when he was there. It was in Corinth that he met fellow tent makers Aquila and Priscilla and befriended them. They worked together, plying their trade. Paul tells the Corinthians at the end of this book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 11, verses 7 through 11, that he did not receive funds for the work that he did in Corinth in laboring for the gospel among them, but instead he accepted support from other churches so that he could support himself and not be a burden to them. Paul, no doubt, also supported himself through his industry of making tents. The Isthmian Games were held every two years in Corinth. They took place in the year leading up to the Olympics and the year following it. Spectators were housed in tents. Athletes were housed in tents. No doubt Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla found much to do in that city that was known for its regular athletic events including also its marketplace with stalls and awnings. One can imagine Paul thinking about the gospel in terms of his trade during his long hours of labor. As he put away and folded up the tents after a day of work, it reminded him of life here. Tents sometimes wore out, which provided work for him too. There was an impermanence to tents. Tents have no foundation, but have fabric that is hung from an overarching structure. Our bodies have skin and organs hung from the structure of our bones. As a Jew, tents reminded Paul also of the sojourn in the wilderness and how his people lived in tents until they were replaced upon arrival to the promised land by permanent structures. When our work is done, we will fold this life over like a tent. We won't be sad about it. This old worn tent will have served its purpose. We have confidence to know we have another tent waiting for us. This confidence is given to us by the Spirit, Paul says, who is given to us as a guarantee. The scriptures have taught us these things, you might say, and it is because of these things that we have been taught through the Spirit, that is, through the Word, the preaching, that we have this anxious hope. Our Lord also knew what tent living was like. He came to earth. The scriptures put it this way, that he tented or dwelt among us. John 1, verse 14. In other words, our Lord took up flesh, just like us. He knew the impermanence of this life. He too is subject to frailty and death and the vicissitudes of life. But by what he did on the cross, we have the hope of an eternal home in the heavens. He won for us eternal life. And by what he did to the grave, we have the promise of new bodies that will not be subject to death and decay. Our life here is full of labor. Paul knew a lot about that. We are looking, he says, for a building from God, a house not made with hands. Paul is basically saying our life here is made with hands. We work with our hands. We make a living with our hands. Where would we be without our hands? Everything we do day in and day out involves them. But the life that comes is not built with our hands at all. Paul says that we will have a building from God made by him. 
What a joy to receive something we didn't make or work for, but is given to us by God. We are looking for the life he has made for us and will give to us as we receive the resurrection of our bodies. Have you known anyone who had a builder make them a house? I'm sure there is glad excitement as to when the project will be done and you can move in. You live in some temporary dwelling place and drive by every day to see what is coming together to make your home. First the windows. Oh, the doors are here. Electrical too was there yesterday and plumbing is tomorrow. The roof was put on. The cabinets and countertops arrived finally to the last nail. It always takes longer than is expected and it is hard to wait. Why can't we wait for our building? Well, we know the builder of this house and we know that the builder is really good. We have seen the finished product in Christ's resurrection. We will not be subject to death and decay. A body is being prepared where there will be no sin, where our body will not be subject to sorrow or sighing or any such thing. We have seen the plans. We know the builder, and it is better than any earthly builder. The one who built the earth is building your home, is the one who hung the stars and the moon in the night sky. This home, that of your body, is here. It is earthly, and it is now. The home is yet to come, that home that is permanent. This home, however, is temporary. That home is one that is eternal. You will never have to move again. We groan here. We await which is, com which is coming with eager expectation. Our home there is built with much expense and labor, even the blood, sweat, and tears of our heavenly carpenter. The home on high is built by God for us as a gift. Paul says that we long to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. Strange words, but here naked means death, the soul fleeing from the body like a tent vacated of its essence, the soul, so death is where there is separation. Paul yearns for life so much that he hopes that he won't ever have to die, but like a shirt someday, simply put the resurrected life over his present substance. He hopes, in other words, that Jesus will come back before the day of his death arrives. And we can yearn for that too, not wanting to be naked, that is, that our body and soul will be separated in death, that the tent of this life will fall down, collapse, and die. It is not that we want to be unclothed at all, but further clothed. We always have to put on our clothes, which gets increasingly more difficult as life goes on. Try putting on compression socks when you're 80. It's next near impossible. Paul imagines the day where he will put on the clothes of the resurrection. He will be fully and forever clothed with the life of God. In this tent, in this transient tent-like life, we are weighted down under a heavy burden. We groan, Paul says. Groaning implies present things, being pained by present existence. Yearning, as Paul states, it implies hoping anxiously for what is to come, future existence. Groaning and yearning are how our life is described here. It is not a longing to escape, but a longing to attain what God has prepared for us. The immortal life he has for us is a spiritual, heavenly, and divine life. Paul yearns for the day when, in his words, Death is swallowed up by life. Swallowed up? Yes, yeah, swallowed up implies nothing that is left of the former, like one fish swallowing another fish whole alive. And this image of Paul also implies the greater power. Life's power is greater than death. But Paul ends with one other feeling we have here, or one other disposition. 
It's surprising that he mentions this last word after all that is said about groaning and yearning. That word is courage, good courage, he says we have. So we are always of good courage. We face the future in confident ways. We face the present in a confident way. Christ has died and is risen, and because of that, we can't wait for what is coming, and we can also face what is here today. No one can take from us what is ours in Christ. We can't wait to be at home with the Lord. And so Paul says, we aim to please him. There are two types of people in this life. Those you work for because you don't want to make them angry, and those you work for because you delight in their approval. You want to please them and desire the only reward, which is their appreciation, their smile, and their nod. So we are headed to the judgment seat of Christ, but our judgment has been already secured by his death. This is not talking about salvation and damnation here, for we already know the verdict. We are set free, and we are in life. But we will meet the one who has done all these things for us and present to him what we have done and what we have said in this life in our bodies. Like a man separated from his wife on a long journey, we can't wait to get back to be reunited and to share life together forever. So we are excited to be with the Lord, which is far better than life here. And so we wait and make it our aim as we are in this tent to please him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.